This video is sponsored by Jerry's Artorama. Jerry's Artorama Online has been serving artists for over 50 years, providing only the best quality art supplies. Jerry's Artorama has premier lines that sell all over the world and are used by millions of artists and professionals worldwide for amazing results. In addition to over 65,000 fine art supplies, choose from over 4,000 free art lessons, oil painting, drawing, acrylics, watercolors, mixed media, and the largest selection of new supplies professionally evaluated and created by artists for artists. Jerry's Artorama has been empowering artists since 1968. We provide reliability, better art supplies, great prices, and exceptional service. The quality of your art matters to us. Hello, everybody. Today, we are going to be debating, quote, bad figure paintings. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need to hear art prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. You are going to see our good and bad picks today. So Alex, let's start with you. This is your bad pick by Italian artist Roberto Ferri. Tell us why this is thumbs down for you. Uh, yeah, it's it looks like the cover of a really bad goth romance novel. It, I hate it. Um, and <laughs> Roberto Ferri, he's a contemporary artist working in Italy. I think his most famous work, he did a portrait of um, one of the recent popes. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's active, but this one is just so, the composition is just non-existent. And it's like, when you look at this one, you know that he knows how to work a brush. You know that he knows how to mix his colors. But when you look at what he did with the lighting to make the figure interesting, what he did with the composition to make it compelling, it's just so bland. Kat, what's your take? I agree. I feel like there's very few things to look at, just a centaur and some trees and that stone, a uh, headstone, I would assume. But not only that, I was just so bothered by the fact that how can the centaur stand like that with the leg missing? It just feels very off balance <laughs> and not believable whatsoever. Like if you were going to just show a centaur with one leg missing, maybe use your imagination and think how a centaur would stand with just three legs. <laughs> Yeah. Slept near one, two, three was saying the same thing. It makes me think like the Rocky Horror Picture Show joke. Like, hey, buddy, where's your leg? <laughs> and yeah, like in some of his other works, like in the thumbnail for this stream, he gets really cool and distorted with like flesh and making it funky. And I'm like, why don't you do that? Why don't you have something like that instead of just, oh, it's a basic centaur weirdly balancing on three legs. Well, I actually just noticed the leg. I didn't even see it. And I've been looking at this for a while because I stumbled the slideshow and now I can't figure it out. Is that a bionic leg? It looks like the bottom of a floor lamp. Is he trying to make it contemporary? I'm just really confused. Kat, do you have a theory on the leg? I believe it is missing. I don't know why. Maybe there's a myth that I'm not aware of. I also noticed that his other arm is not in view, but I believe the arm's still there. It's just like happens to be hidden. I don't know. I'm questioning many choices with this three-legged <laughs> centaur. I'm also questioning like, why is he holding the staff over there? Can't he just hold the staff on the other side to balance his weight or something? You know, there's just like so many obvious answers to the problems posed in this painting i'm just questioning everything oh yeah like y'all are being good visual detectives too just being like shouldn't it be in the other hand because yeah honestly even compositionally that would work much better too like john north andrew <laughs> will hear it pointed that out uh seven angelic i thought this was funny was saying maybe the tomb is for his missing leg <laughs> that might be the story well i can't figure out why he's holding a street lamp. But the thing is, there's all these conflicting things in terms of time period, because that tomb looks like it's trying to be somewhat historical, but he looks like a bad GQ model. I don't know, like something's not lining up in terms of time period. 
What do you think, Kat? <laughs> Bad GQ model. I was, yeah, I was thinking that too. <laughs> but yeah, I agree. Just something about that headstone versus the myth of the centaur. Those time periods don't quite line up for me. And something also about those trees. Maybe it's just my point of view, but I've only seen those kinds of trees in curated spaces, like curated human spaces. So it just feels like your park next door almost. <laughs> yeah, and it's just so like I say romance novel cover because the only thing that could save this composition is big letters with like, you know, the centaur in the tomb, you know, like that's the only thing that could save it. And even then. <laughs> or maybe Alex, the artist is just horsing around as what Mira says. <laughs> all right, so this one's getting pretty much an all around pen from all of us. So I think we're pretty much in consensus here. And by the way, those are really boring clouds. Like, dude, come on, you can do better. What do you think, Gat? Oh, absolutely. Actually, for those of you who follow our prof on Instagram, I visited Clara recently. And I realized when going through the Utah landscape how dramatic clouds can be. And you don't really get that in California. It's just a few wisps or none at all. But when I was in Utah, the first thing I noticed was really how big everything was and how, how dramatic the clouds were. So after that Utah trip, I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh, that's just that's such a letdown. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ripple of Aqua says, let's not even mention the lamppost staff that he's holding feels very Victorian. Alex, thoughts? Yeah, it's, I think it's the, the things that don't connect are so small that they just seem off rather than something to make this image exciting. Like on paper, this image should be exciting. Cheesy, yes, but you could make it exciting. And that's, I'll borrow what uh, Caspa Life said of perhaps it's the composition that just needs a little rearranging. Like, I'm, I don't want to shame an illustrator for wanting to do a centaur holding a cool lamppost. That's, yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. Go for it. But throw in some secondary light sources, throw in some interesting colors. Like, Kat, you were saying with the trees, like, make some cool forest around that, you know? Mm -hmm. All right. Next pick is Cats, and this is by Gerald Gibbs, and he's a fairly young artist. He got his MFA from Maryland Institute College of Art in 2020, and a lot of his work is about Black identity, family memories. He works a lot from Polaroids. He's got gallery representation and currently lives in Baltimore. So Kat, why is this a thumbs up? And tell us in the chat if this is thumbs up or thumbs down for you. I think it's really difficult to stylize to stylize period let alone just the human figure but i feel like daryl gibbs is heading in a really good direction with his work in this case i read that he uses a lot of polaroid photos for his references and at first i thought oh what kind of like a reference how good can a polaroid photo reference be but then I realized oh it's like a really good way to pare down the image to its bare essentials and then great for stylizing. <laughs> and I think Gerald Gibbs is doing a great job with that in, I'll say most of his paintings, because I actually chose one of his paintings for my thumbs down. <laughs> but in this case, I feel like the figure makes sense to me, the way it is stylized. I think that the brush strokes and the shirt and the face match up well. I'm not so bothered that you can't really see the arms and the hands that clearly, but I think that the cup placed in the hands is a really good decision. And something that's noteworthy about figure painting is that it is not just about the figure. It is how the figure interacts with the space around it and the objects it interacts with. So in this case, I think Gerald Gibbs is doing a great job. I will say that I'm not a fan of the middle composition though. <laughs> Alex, what's your take? I I think overall, I think I really like it. Um, Neil was, oh, sorry, uh, was talking about the tangent of the head. And yeah, those are, I think those little things are the only things that bother me because I love the pattern in the shirt being there, but also still being very flat within it and focusing all of your attention into there. Kat, like you were saying, drawing into the hands, holding that red cup. 
I'm really digging it. It's just those tiny little tangent errors that like I can't get my eye away from. You guys are gonna make me the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> because I like Gerald Gibbs. I've seen his work before, but I'm not a fan of this one. There's parts I like. So if we go back to the full scene, I'm so intrigued by all the objects, the oyster shells at the bottom with the caviar, that orange is super luminous. I like the reflections. And I love, does everybody see this little figure? in the back. I don't know what it is. I mean, it's really small, but I just feel like the scene captures the quirkiness of a lot of bars. And that's what's really fun about it. But I just feel like it's a bunch of fragmented pieces. Like there's not a lot of connection. So it's sort of like a painting that has good parts, but the parts are not well assembled. I don't like those horizontals in the back matching the horizontals. The space is not very well defined. Kat, what do you think? I think those Am are I all just being mean. No, I don't think you're being mean at all. And honestly, <laughs> right before this room, I was like, oh my God, did I make the right choice for this painting? <laughs> because going through Gerald, Gerald Gibbs' site, I was like, I can't just choose one that's totally great, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so I chose one that would be a little bit harder to vouch for, in my opinion. And I think that there are great parts to the piece, as Clara said. But I also, once Clara brought it up, I was like, yeah, I do agree with those things. I feel like the space is really hard to be united. I think what's really carrying the painting is the objects. But there are still great parts to this painting, and we can't deny that. I love the objects. That's also one of the reasons why I chose this piece. And what I like about them is that they're so particular, as Clara said, with the oysters, but they are also really stylized. Like that bottle and the shot glass on the bottom left is so flat, yet somehow it still matches with the rest of this, the stylization. And I was thinking that the flatness of the space is also a part of it. Like the reason why it's so flat perhaps is so that you can focus on those objects. Well, Alex, what do you think about the space? Because I think that in figurative painting, the relationship of the figure to the space is hugely important. And oftentimes people don't talk about it. People just talk about the figure because they think, oh, the figure is the main event. But in my opinion, the background is almost better because the story that's being told through the objects, I mean, yeah, he's got a really cool shirt, but <laughs> beyond that, I don't know that much about him. I'm actually more intrigued by the objects. Alex, what do you think about space and objects? I think that's such an important part for this one in telling that narrative and that mm -hmm. feeling of, yeah, when you were saying of like how stereotypical bar it is, but not just any bar, a very particular type of bar, like the the infamous red solo cup, like the keg system operating from under the bar. It's very haphazard, very put together. The cups don't match. And I love all those little details. I actually, I think I don't like how well articulated the oysters are. I like the stylization of the bottle and the shot glass, how it's just almost a flat geometric shape that works really well. But like that nice, sh like reflected form of the oysters on that bar top is almost like a visual speed bump for me. Like, oh, wait, this is actually really highly rendered. Jane says, the colors in the shirt hmm. remind me of the Baltimore Ravens uniforms, purple, black, and gold. I bet you anything that's not an accident because Gerald Gibbs lives in Maryland, Baltimore specifically. <laughs> and so I like those little hidden stories that a lot of us are not going to see, but that some people do see. It's almost like a little Easter egg for people to notice. What do you think about the shirt, Kat? Because it is very bright and busy. I agree. In fact, I'm really happy that Jane pointed that out because I don't think any of us would have known that. And that just goes to show that certain pieces of art are truly meant for specific audiences. And perhaps we aren't that audience, but it doesn't mean that we cannot enjoy this piece of work and we cannot talk about it like we're doing now. But yeah, I agree. I think this piece is speaking to a very particular audience and it just makes it all the more interesting for it. Alex, Rebecca is saying, when you evaluate these paintings, do you consider techni technical skill as something of value? That's such a good question. I think that it's definitely something in my mind when evaluating it. 
but I'd say more than technical skill is intention of stylization, I'd say. Um, like in a way like this painting, it doesn't show the depths of technical skill that are behind it. Like similar, like the most common example people say is like the years and years of like highly rendered standard typical figure drawing Picasso did before diving into cubism, you know? So I think that I place that consistency of the style and the intention behind it higher in my mind than technical ability. Yeah, I don't think that technical skill in itself is the most important thing. And I think sometimes it can actually be a problem. Sometimes the technical skill is so dramatic that you just forget about everything else. Or other times artists think that technical skill will compensate for lack of a subject. And I think that's when it becomes a problem because these are not mm -hmm. super realistic paintings, but I don't want it to be. I think that the style of the painting has a quirkiness that is a little rough around the edges, but that fits the story in my opinion. Kat, what do you think? Technical skill is, it is difficult to talk about because I think everyone needs it inherently. People need to understand that you have a certain level that you can draw at. Now, beyond that is, is a matter of how do you use it? Do you use it as a crutch, as Clara said? Maybe about the last artist. <laughs> <laughs> or, crutch like a centaur with three legs, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> or do you sort of transcend it? Do you understand the basis? And then do you choose to stylize something in a, in a not conformative way? All right, this is my thumbs down pick. This is The Feast of Herod by Lucas Cranach the Elder. He's an artist from the German Renaissance. And he had a pretty sweet gig. He was the court painter for the electors of Saxony. And I can't stand the table. The table's driving me crazy because the figures are kind of cool. Like I love the female figure in the foreground. I mean, she's Salome, she's awesome. I mean, who goes around carrying a plate of a beheaded male? <laughs> love that. I just love the story. But that table, like, what were you thinking, Lucas Craddock? It looks like a white box I bought at the container store. What, I'm supposed to believe that is a table when you can paint clothing like that? Like, I'm just really disappointed. And he's not on Instagram, so sorry, you can't look him up. <laughs> look him up on the, on the museum websites. <laughs> Alex, what do you think? First, I wish that there was like a verified account of the real <laughs> Lucas Kranich. <laughs> like, <laughs> I am, I agree with everything you said positively about the figures, especially Salome front and center. The table, I think it has such, I'll say it just David Lynchy vibes, similar to like the infamous <laughs> red room of just big sheet of white just there. And it's so oppressive that it, I, I kind of can't help but read into it a little bit, you know? Cause yeah. in that sense of like, okay, dude, we know you can paint fabric like nobody's business. So why did you make this just a sheet of soft tofu? <laughs> that is not tofu. Have you? That's eaten exactly tofu what soft tofu looks like before. That you is switch. not. <laughs> <laughs> Kat, what do you think? I'm torn because I feel like without the table, it would just be another really fancy painting and it honestly would not stick in my mind as much. So I guess it's all about intent. And as Alex said, why did he put that there? I think it's just for us to remember it better. And therefore I'm actually for the weird tofu table. <laughs> <laughs> it silhouettes Salome really well. Yeah. This close up is making me, I get the disembodied head, but it kind of squishy. <laughs> Has oh, anyone else seen that? You know, it, where it's a little. It reminds me of someone like taking off their rubber mask and we're like, and it was me the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the King's gesture of like, oh no, thank you. I could not another bite. I couldn't possibly. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, it's so good.
I really want to point out this comment from Ripple of Aqua that said, not the one thumb on the head plate if you look at this image. But I think that just goes to show that Kranich really thought about everything. Therefore, it, the table cannot be a coincidence. I And I think it works in his favor. Well, the whole thing about Lucas Kranich, this dude can paint. I mean, look at all these outfits. It's insane, the amount of technical detail that's in here. But I think he also totally knew what he was doing. I mean, he knows that these people are creepy and wonky and have no skeletal structure. And so I do not doubt for a second that that wonky thumb on the plate is totally on purpose. But the table's not memorable for a good reason, Kat. It's like, did he just get lazy? Or, I mean, really, you think he did that on purpose? So we it's can remember. His <laughs> it's very modern. <laughs> I think he did it on purpose. He, he even put like a slight ripple, the, the fold of the cloth coming off in the edge. <laughs> Something's yeah. really bugging me, which reminds me like the earlier comment of like, how do you judge like technical ability in these? And like, as we're looking, it's like, yeah, he's got chops with fabric. Yeah, he's got chops with color, but he can't paint an ellipsis to save his life. <laughs> like, look at how like war. So I'd say that's that way of like, if you enter into the court of wanting to have like that strong technical ability, for me, it's like, you gotta be on point. Cause then it's like, you know, I know that that is not a stylized wonky plate. That's just a wonky plate. I mean, that plate looks like it's made out of silicone. You know, those silicone baking sheets you can get now? <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, maybe you need something a little bit more sturdy. <laughs> Jason says, I feel like he's trolling with this painting a little. Is, is that what it is? Is he trying to just tease us a little bit with this painting? You know what? I actually like the following comment by Adrian that says, I like it as an experiment. I feel like Kranich was trying to be bold with this painting, especially with that table. And perhaps it does work better as an experiment. Maybe if he had just continued in this path <laughs> and made other paintings with tofu tables, he would have gotten somewhere that you would have liked, Clara. <laughs> or maybe everyone is turning the tables on me. Thank you, Sletnir. <laughs> We're putting the soft tofu tables on you. <laughs> All right, we are back to Roberto Ferry. Alex, why is this a thumbs up for you? Oh, and by the way, those two little white rectangles they're there so we don't get demonetized by youtube so you can go look up the image later it's called mm -hmm. resurrection okay alex mm -hmm. why is this a thumbs up i am just like whereas the other one was the cover of a bad romance novel this one's the cover of like an underground heavy metal band and so i'm like okay i'm, I'm I'll, I'll stay for a little longer and look at it but i think this one He's still falling under the shortcomings, I think, that a lot of his work does. Of like, he's riding solely on his technical ability, doesn't really think about composition, but in this one, he's pushing it further. He's making things a little bit more funky. He's having a little bit more fun with the lighting and the environment. Like, my favorite parts of this are the gnarled tree stump and then that weird head that the foot is pressing against. Like, I love those bits. And I think this one's that cool vibe of very, very traditional classical painting with a little bit of funkiness in there. Kat, what do you think? I think this is the better of Harry's works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's honestly not my cup of tea, but I respect anyone's opinion if they do like this, because I do, as I said before, I think this is one of the better ones of his works. I really like the triangle composition. I wish stuff would go off the, the page some more rather than it being kind of like squished into the center. The triangle-ness of it reminds me of Raft of the Medusa if we are going to compare it to like great works that already exist. And I agree with Alex. I think that the little parts where the artist is getting more imaginative, such as that weird head that the foot is pressing down on and the tree stumps, roots. Those are, yeah, I think that it needs to be pushed some more, but it's headed in the right direction. I will also say, though, before the stream, Clara was like, the person on top is Lucifer. And I was like, oh, it's Lucifer. 
<laughs> I just feel like I've seen that kind of depiction of dark fallen angel or whatever so many times. I'm like, I, I wish you were a little, a lot more imaginative with this. <laughs> I'll so Sonnet something. is saying, definitely getting heavy metal bands vibes. Exactly. Like to me, it would actually be a better painting if he would ham it up a little because this to me, it's bordering on a Frank Frazetta sci-fi 70s <laughs> illustration, yeah. but it's not quite there. It's trying to be classical painting and we are resurrecting the Renaissance because that was back when painting was good and everybody who makes contemporary art now sucks. Like I totally know this group of people and they have this strange attitude of we need to paint like the Renaissance again and we're better than everybody else. Maybe Roberto Ferri is not one of those people, but to me, this fits in that genre of a very <laughs> specific group of people in the art world who strongly believe this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think honestly tied to that, it's like just in between the lines of, I think that idea of like, oh, we need to paint like the Renaissance again, is this inherent idea of like, does he only paint white bodies? Does he only paint comically muscular bodies? And Clara, when you mentioned the last one of like, it's not just muscular male bodies. It's like GQ model muscular male bodies, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, it, it's, um, and yeah, Kat, when you were talking compositionally, nothing's going off the page. It's, I feel like he is at this crossroads of choosing between, do I want to be just a boring, like, I wish the Renaissance was back kind of painter, or do I want to let myself be a little more wild and kind of break the mold. Well, Kat, is it unfair of us to look at this painting and say, dude, why are you only painting white bodies? Or because not every artist's work has to be about diversity, or what do you think? I think the artist should be somewhat aware of the times we live in. And I think that inevitably your artwork should reflect that. Now it made sense, does it? I, I don't, I'm not a history major, spoiler, but it kind of makes sense to me that if you're like an, in the Renaissance and you're stuck in Italy and you only see white people, then of course you're only gonna paint white people. That just makes sense, right? But I would assume that Roberto, Roberto Ferri has seen a person of color. I would assume so. And so it is bizarre to me that he wouldn't paint what he sees. He wouldn't paint reflecting upon his time as an artist now. Well, for me, so much of being an artist is a reaction to your time period. I mean, think about any great movement, any work of art basically that's ever been made, for the most part is a reaction to the world and events that are happening. And I just feel like if you're painting like this now and you don't have anything beyond muscular male bodies and women enraptured by their touch, you're putting blinders on pretty intentionally. Because as you said, they didn't have the internet in the Renaissance. I mean, you couldn't get on the plane and go see people. I'm like, dude, come on, get, get out of your little time capsule and, and just wake up to see what's around you. <laughs> Alex, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't be Alex if I didn't think of a movie that this made me think of. I love Amadeus. And in that when um, young Mozart is like fighting for wanting to tell an opera of a story he wrote and is arguing with everyone of like, why do we have to tell the stories of Hercules again and again and again and again? And yeah, when you get trapped in this, I'd imagine it would also be kind of boring of like, what is this piece about? It's like, nothing much, just some memento mori thrown in there. And I'm like, okay, anything else? <laughs> like, yeah, it's like just full on riding the lightning on that technical ability of can paint a figure really, 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 really well. Full stop. Alex, I thought this was your thumbs up pick. <laughs> I think it's that fine line between like you can be critical of an artist and um, hope that they grow in a way that fits your taste selfishly as a viewer. <laughs> like, yeah, but like I think that compared with the two, this one is pushing in that direction. It has a beautiful circle of these figures and it's pushing that distortion well. 
But I think, yeah, Ariel's overall, it's raising some big pieces. Ariel says there were people of color, even in Italy, in the Renaissance. Hmm. What do you think, Kat? Well, it just goes to show that I don't really know history. But also, <laughs> I mean, during the Renaissance, I'm sure there was power dynamics, too. Like, who could afford getting a painting done? Who were the paintings for? Um, and the answer was, well, white Italians in Italy. And But the times have changed. And I think that artwork needs to reflect that, too. And I think artists should really pay attention to that and not just like blind themselves to it. All right. The next pick is Cats. This is a thumbs down by Gerald Gibbs. So why thumbs down, Cat? I almost feel like I don't need to explain myself. But anyways, <laughs> I, was like, I was looking through Gerald Gibbs' work and collection. And when I saw this, I couldn't almost couldn't believe that Gerald Gibbs released this out. Just looking at it, as a figurative painting. I don't like how the figures are treated. I think that it's just the way that the way they're just cut off at the knee and so different in style from the background just gives me a really uncomfortable feeling. I also feel like some of the anatomy is a little bit off. Like I feel like the person wearing White's arm is too long and it feels like a mistake rather than a stylization. But as I said before, also figures aren't just Figure paintings aren't just about the figure. Figures need to interact with the space. And the space is atrocious, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> I just feel like there was, the, the, all the care was put into rendering these figures and none of it was put into the background. The background just feels like an experiment. And the figures just don't settle in. Like not even the lighting doesn't match either. The figures feel like it's some sort of camera with a flash on, but the background suggests a sunny open space. Alex, agree? Disagree? I'm going to be honest. I was all set to disagree saying that I personally thought I liked this more, but you were just so accurate and just like, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's a good, yeah, I can Okay, yeah. <laughs> Where I think what I was drawn to most was like the intriguing, the joy that the colors brought me. Honestly, that nice, I love that yellow blue combo seeping throughout the entire canvas. I think that's a beautiful touch. But yeah, you made like all of these points. You're exactly right. Like it's, it's distracting no matter how much I love the figures there. I'm like, oh, I love the figures if I can just do this, you know? Mm -hmm. Cosba Life says, oh man, the figures look out of place, but their clothing is so cool. Wish I could see more of them. I don't like this painting, but I do like the clothes, Cosba Life, because they are really specific. I think so much of the time when I'm critiquing artwork, I get on people about clothing because oftentimes you see people in the white t-shirt and black pants and people don't no, for some reason, when they're painting people, that oh, people do not dress like that for the most part. You could just walk down the street. People wear earrings. They wear accessories. They carry bags. Like not, nothing's that pared down. And what I like about this is the specific pair of glasses. I, I love them. They're so wonky. Like they look like they're broken. And his mom has been very irresponsible and hasn't taken him to the eye glass place. Not like I'm speaking from personal experience, but um, this happened with one of my kids this past week. But anyway, it makes me think about that. And I just love the specificity of the clothing. That's great. But, oh my God, the fence. Oh, Carol Kips, come on. You're such a good painter. Why did you do that fence? <laughs> this comment from uh, Jay Sonoa, uh, I think perfectly describes what like I want this to be. It's like, yeah, and why I'm, the colors initially draw me in so well. It does feel very dreamlike. And I think if that seeped into the rest of it, I would be so much more on board. Like it all just kind of everything below the fence. It's not just a poorly painted fence. It's also just white and green and blue. And that's it. There's no exciting textures down there. No, nothing. 
I agree. I'm not against the two styles going on. What I am against is how they are incorporated together. And I just feel like they're not. They're not incorporated together. I wish that maybe, as we saw in the first Gerald Gibbs painting, maybe something about this clothing could be stylized, painted in the same way as the plants or the fence. Or maybe the humans could be interacting, like picking the flowers or even like touching a fence or something to bridge that disparity, but I don't see it. I think Joe Nowhere has figured this out. The artist put the fence to hide their feet. Come on, Alex, you have drawn hands in the pockets to avoid Almost them, right? Almost the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Hands in pockets, hands behind the back, feet going off the page, just avoid all of that <laughs> hard to draw stuff. Long flowing dresses to just cover the feet. Yep. <laughs> I just think if he took out the fence and just left, and you can tell the fence was added later, like just stop, okay? The painting was fine before the fence. The fence is just killing me because the rest of it's pretty good. It just, I don't know, that sort of makes me sad. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, wrong image, wrong comment. JD Corgan says, I'm confused, but are there two suns, one orange and one red? Are they balloons? What's your theory, Kat? I think, again, it's some sort of abstraction, some kind of stylization. I'm actually not too, I, I like it. <laughs> I think that it adds some more interest into the painting because without that second sun, it is just a friendly, sunny, outdoor backyard image. But suddenly with that second sun, I think it lends itself to the dreamlike quality Alex spoke of earlier. All right, my thumbs up, again, another Lucas Cranach, the elder. And I have to tell all of you a little bit about this story because it's hilarious. This is an image of Hercules and Omphile with some maids. And it's an image of Hercules spinning wool. Does everybody see that hand at the bottom? He's like holding some of the wool. And then the thing in the upper almost upper right. I thought it was a berm at first, but that's part of the spinning wheel. And the female in the orange dress, she's holding onto that. So basically Hercules was enslaved to Unfile, and she was the queen of Lydia in Asia Minor. And so this is an image of him being enslaved and he was forced to do women's work. I don't have all the other details, but that's basically the story behind it. And I, first of all, I think that's hilarious. I didn't even know <laughs> that this happened to Hercules and I was really into Greek mythology when I was a kid. I just think the composition is so weird. I mean, these are evil women. I mean, they know exactly what they're doing. And I just think that the power dynamics, like them pulling and pushing him and, I don't know, I just could keep looking at this. It's so strange and bizarre. Kat, what's your take? I agree. I really liked hearing that story. I would not have quite understood what was going on if you hadn't told that story. What I appreciate about this piece that I didn't see in the last Kranich piece was the different positions of everyone's face. I don't know why that stood out to me, but in the previous painting, everyone was at three quarters, literally everybody. But in this piece, it's much more dynamic. Like we see one lady staring right at the viewer. We see one lady kind of looking down and it just feels like there is more interaction between the people. And that draws me into the story. Alex, agree or disagree? I agree. I'm personally torn about whether or not I, I like them both. <laughs> I like this chronic fella, <laughs> but um, so I can't decide which one I like more. I love the expressions too, where people are saying like, yeah, he doesn't look like he's struggling with it. And for me, he has that look of like, whenever you're learning a new task for the first time, he's like, so you do it like this, right? Like I'm doing it right. Oh, okay. Yeah. He looks very eager to try it out. Um, and also I'm just like, I love the kind of like borderline, like spooky witchy vibes going on and like encircling him with it. I'm, it's, it's really cool. Saposta so says he seems to enjoy it. That's what I think is hilarious about this piece is that you can read it 
in a lot of different ways. Like as Jazz W says, he doesn't look like he's suffering. Is he enjoying it? And so you sort of wonder, is Kranich showing us little nuances, his own opinion on a narrative? Because a lot of these myths, you can interpret them however you want. And the other thing that's hilarious, you have to imagine, Kranich painted this in the Renaissance, but it's an ancient Greek myth. And I think this is hilarious that Hercules is hanging out with Renaissance women. It's, it's so funny. It's just every single wonky, funny thing. It's such a weird painting. I just love the wackiness of that. So Kat, what do you think about that? Hercules in the Renaissance? <laughs> um, I agree. It's just fun. You know, it's like it's a painting as you learn more about it and look more, you'll discover more and just it's an experience. I wanted to pull up this comment, though, by Slept Near that said, this is nice, but all the female faces are of the same female arc. <laughs> and I do agree. I think that Kranach does suffer from same face syndrome. For those of you who don't know, it's basically if an artist draws one kind of face for every kind of person they draw. <laughs> and <laughs> most often than not, women, especially young women, are victim to the same face syndrome as a subject in art. And I think that's actually very good to point out. Alex, what about what W315 brings up? Oh no, it's another comment. They were asking about the dead war birds on the wall. How about that? I would love to dive in further on that because I know like the for me, that's that my favorite part of Renaissance paintings. They're all like, oh, and we put in like a bunch of orange, oranges on the table. It's like, hmm, of course. What? Because at the time it was very big on symbolism of fruits and birds, on animals, on flowers, and everything. Everything had a symbol that everyone kind of knew and understood. Um, my first thought is that it like them being hung like a hunting trophy. It's the thought of that, like, um, removal of Hercules' masculinity of like, oh, now like you're wearing a dress, you're learning how to sew. That's my first thought on it. So I would be very curious about specifically what kind of birds those are, because I bet like it was an inside joke that he put in for his time period. I don't know exactly what they're meant to symbolize, but I would guess that they have something to do with representing his situation, which is that he's trapped and helpless <laughs> with all of these evil women. And I think that that's great. I think it fills that upper left-hand corner because if you didn't have that, it would be too empty. And it's another sign of the times. That's what people were doing back then. Yeah. Ray, uh, Ray Mustard made a great point. Birds were hung to be tenderized, which is true, but it's kind of like um, it, another movie, No Country for Old Men. There's a scene when Javier Bardem is talking to a shop clerk and behind him are a bunch of extension cords and they're hung like nooses. And it's so ominous. It's like, yes, that's how extension cords are hung, but it's also like, oh, but he put it there, you know? Mm -hmm. So that I, I think there is a meaning behind the birds. Although W315 <laughs> says maybe it shows that they're in a kitchen. Do you think it's maybe supposed to show the environment, Kat? Maybe. I think it's more symbolism than, I don't know, maybe it's also symbolism of the environment. I'm torn. <laughs> I don't know enough. But speaking of the environment, I'm not sure how I feel about the really flat gray. I wish at least there was some more shadow on it to give it more depth. Um, because the more I look at it, the more I'm like really excited by all the subjects I see. And then I become a little disappointed when I see how haphazard the background was. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the background is benign. It's mm -hmm. not hurting the painting, but it's also not really helping either. Because I agree with you, it is a pretty flat space, but there's a whole circus going on in this narrative and I'm just sucked into that right now. We do have other streams where we have our takes on quote, bad 2D compositions, bad abstract compositions that all of you can check out. And also this Google slideshow is available. The link is in the YouTube video description below and it's also on our new website, artprof.org, which if you haven't seen, check it out. Art Prof is a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. 
And in a few minutes, Kat and Alex will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord. They will be in the post live streams channel. So you can talk about tofu tables and centaurs with three legs. <laughs> Subscribe to our channel, like this video, leave us a comment. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. And I'm so happy to see three names on the third slide. So thank you very much to everybody. When you help us, you help somebody in the world who can't afford an art class. So everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.